Hallelujah. I'm trying to keep it down this morning. I've got to take us back on our journey again, and I don't want to keep you in church longer than you're supposed to be in church, because I need you to stay dialed in with me. Amen. For those of you who were with us for the first time this morning, we welcome you. We're glad you're here with us. Amen. We hope you feel the peace of God, the presence of God. What we're doing is we're taking a journey which started last Sunday, your spiritual journey. And what we're unpacking for you this month is we're talking about the essentials. Amen? What, what, what is it that God is doing and how you can be a part of that? And today we're going to, last week we talked about to encounter God. What does that look like to have a changed life? Amen? To, to, to be with Jesus. And to become like Jesus. If you missed that, you can go back and, and review that. But today we're going to talk, take you back into Acts chapter 9. And we're going to get back on that journey. And we're going to talk to you this morning a little bit about getting established. Somebody say getting established. Getting established. You're going to get established in your faith. But the way that you get established in your faith, the way that God has designed it, is that you get established in your local church, into a family where you can connect, where you can know and be known, where you can grow in your faith, grow in relationships. And so we're going to kind of give you today a little tour of what we do here, who we are, what we do. And again, what we're asking those of you who are visiting with us, if you're looking for a church to belong to, stay with me till the end of this month before you make a decision. Amen. I believe that, I mean, you owe it to yourself to know exactly what God has going on here in this house. And then you make a decision at the end of the month if this, you believe this is where God wants you to be. And if, and if you don't believe it is, I would encourage you, go and find a church that matches your heartbeat. Come on. Because everyone belongs in a family. Every one of God's children belongs in a spiritual family. And that's what the church is. So I want to encourage that this morning. Go with me into the book of Acts chapter 9. Let's continue our journey with Started talking last week about Paul, how he met God on the road to Damascus, and how he was transformed by his encounter with God. Acts chapter 9, verse 3 through 8, I'll read quickly. It says, Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. Rise and enter the city, and you will be told here what to do. Now the men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. All right, Father, bless us today as we journey again into your word. Open our eyes and help us to see wonderful things. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the church say amen. amen. So, all right, this is step two. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, come on. No, 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 no. I, I, I'm staying here. I'm staying right here. I love it here. I want to be close to my wife. Amen. <laughs> so, he, um, uh, we're going we're gonna to take you through a journey today. And today what we're going to focus on is on um, what it looks like to be a part of a local church. Now, let me, let me bring you back to Paul. Now, Paul, what is happening with Paul here? Notice when he meets the Lord, he has an experience with God that is very, very real. And it's very transformative. Whenever you encounter God, it transforms your life. That's the point of encountering God. But then Paul has to be taken by the hand and led to a place where he can connect with the, 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 uh, another man whose name was Ananias, who we, we, we suppose is a more senior man who is more established in God. That man's role is to help Paul get settled in his faith. Paul had an experience, but he now needed to be taught. He now needed to understand what this experience that he had with God meant for his life. Because how many of you know when your life becomes transformed and you experience God in that way, 
God saves you on purpose for a purpose. And one of the things that he tells Paul here is that we're, you, we're gonna, he says, rise and go to Damascus and you will be shown there what you are to do. How many of you know that when you've been transformed, God has a work for you to do? And for you to do that work effectively, you need to now begin to understand this, this new relationship that you've come into. You need to begin to learn and grow in your faith and become established because I would submit to you that God does not save us to simply set us in a corner and let us gather dust until we die or until he comes again. I mean, God saves you to bring you into a family to teach you about his ways and to release you to go and make a difference in the world around you. That's the picture I have. And so today, we're going to move you more into that process. Amen? Today we're going to teach you a little bit about getting established. So we're going to talk about what it looks like to be a part of Generations Church. All right? So let me tell you a little bit about our church just to, to begin with today. Some of you already know our story because you've been, me, been with me for years, but some of you may not know our story. In 1994, we started a church in our home. My wife and our five children and just a few friends came to be with us. We were in our living room and then from September we went the next month. There's so many people gathering that we went into our basement. I fixed up my basement a little bit and we could hold a few more people there and so we started having 35 seats in my basement and we were having church there and in April of 1995 it, it, it had just gotten to be too much. Too many people were raiding my refrigerator after church. House church has its drawbacks. People, my kids were taking people on tours through our little house, and I said, you know, this has got to stop. So we found our first public uh, uh, place of worship at 38 East 1st Street and really began to have church. In November of 1995, uh, I was ordained officially as a pastor. So Brother Ray became Pastor Ray, and I've been the pastor of the church ever since. We moved to uh, New Rochelle back in September of 2004 after 10 years of uh, serving the community of Mount Vernon. And we were having church in New Rock City, Regal Cinemas. And we became known as Church at the Movies. Where else could you hear a good sermon and worship Jesus with the smell of popcorn wafting through the air? I mean, that's just, that was just something special. You, you, it was to live for. And we grew there. I mean, our church began to explode there. And if you missed those days, boy, how many of you were there with me when we were church at the movies? Come on. Weren't those great days? Those were fun days. And we really learned how to serve our community and work as a team. And that was a turning point in our lives. And then in 2006, the Lord finally blessed us and we moved to Main Street. And here we are. Hallelujah. So our church today has become a landmark church in our city. And uh, we're just grateful for that because we're here. When we moved here in 2004, I told city manager that we want to make a difference here. And we want to partner with the city to help make a difference. And if there was anything that the city had that they wanted to see change, our church was here to bless the city. Chuck Strong was the city manager. And he looked at me and said, you've taken me quite off guard, Reverend, because no one's ever come to me and said that to me before. Um, when people come to me, they usually come asking for things. I said, well, we come to bless the city. Amen. And that has been our mission ever since. God brought us here on purpose for a purpose. And so you are part of a church that has uh, uh, a, a God-ordained purpose and a God-ordained positioning and placement in the city where we are. We love this city and we're here to seek its blessing. Amen. Come on, clap your hands if you like that. That's good. You're part of something good. Hallelujah. So, a little bit about our church. All right? Um, just a few things. Our mission is that which Jesus gave to the church. In Matthew 28, Jesus said, Go into all the world and make disciples of the nations, teaching them to observe everything I've taught you. So our mission statement would read like this. We're here to impact generations and to disciple the nations with the gospel of Jesus. Can you say that with me? We're here to impact the generations and disciple the nations with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what is the vision for those of you who care 
I mean, you know, every organization, and I believe churches too, should have a vision statement because that is really what defines who we are and how we function. Well, the first thing is we like to believe our church to be a place where people can encounter God, find freedom, amen, discover purpose, and then go make a difference. We believe that, that this is the purpose of God. As I said it, I'm reiterating that God doesn't just save us. God has a plan, and I believe it's a four-step plan. First, you encounter God, but then you, you, you find freedom. You, you get set free from all the bondage, you, or the addictions. You get free from the lies that you've been fed. You get free. Amen? Because God wants free people serving him. Free people worship. Free people yeah, give. Yeah. Free people volunteer. Yeah. Free people love others. God wants you free, not serving him with issues and all kinds of things that will tie you down. And so I believe in that. And so yeah, you, we teach you. And next week, next week, you don't want to miss next week, we're going to really get into talking to you about how do you discover purpose. Because you're going to find that God has blessed you with gifts. God has equipped you already to serve. And so next week, we're going to go through that aspect. But let me not jump ahead. Because the whole purpose of it is to really position you and I to make an impact, to make a difference. We came here to make a difference. That is our mission. And God is already using us to do that. How many of you see that already? We have what we call some values. Values are kind of like what defines the philosophy of every organization. Things that we highly value. Things that if you're going to walk with us and be a part of this family, you're going to find that we place an emphasis on these things. It defines the spirit of who we are as a local church. And the first one is a passion for God. The Bible says you must love the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. So our first value is always God first. Love the Lord with all your heart. I believe if we learn to love the Lord with all our hearts, loving other people is easy. Loving other people is easy when God's love has filled your heart. So that we believe in having a passion for God. Jesus said, anyone who has been forgiven much will love much. And so it's a natural response from us to love the Lord with all our heart. If you can just shut that off for me, I'd appreciate it. Amen. The second one is compassion for people. Compassion for people. This is very important because I believe a very close second to loving God is you've got to have a love for people. It is, it is, it is not even uh, approaching truth to suggest that, yes, I love the Lord, but I can't stand people. That doesn't even sound right. When God's love fills your heart, a very close second to loving God is, man, I... I, I I'm a diff- maybe I didn't love people before. Maybe I used to be a, uh, Ebenezer Scrooge. Maybe I used to be the Grinch. But man, now I love people. And, and, and that's, that's the essence of it. And we, we highly value that. Because if you see the price that Jesus paid to redeem people, you and I had better know that if we're going to be a part of this team, we've got to love and treat people right when they come through our doors. Because Jesus thinks people are priceless. So loving and compassion for people is the next, the third, the second. The third uh, high value for us is community. Somebody say community. Community. Church is not a building that you, you know, you go to. It's a family you belong to. Church is not a building you go to. It's a family you belong to. And as a family, we are united under Jesus' lordship, irrespective of our ethnicity, our social status, or gender. As God's household, we seek to live out his truth as we worship together, as we walk together, and as we work together. That's the essence of it. We believe in community. And that also speaks for the word unity is very much attached to community. And that's what we're saying. We are all united as one under Jesus. We don't, we don't, we're, we're, your ethnicity doesn't matter. God has one race. It's called the human race. Amen. And if you want to think, come on. Yes. We may have different ethnic backgrounds, which is important because your culture matters. But the biggest part of this is that we are all a part of that one race. The race of God's redeemed. And we love people. Amen. Despite their condition. Despite all of those other external things. Because that's the love that God has shown us. Another value that is high for us is generosity. 
Generos- Somebody say generosity. Generosity is about giving more than what's required of you. It's going that extra mile. And here in our church, we see giving as a privilege. It's something we get to do, not something we got to do. Amen? And, and generosity is about we're generous with our time, we're generous with our talent, and we're generous with our treasures because God has given richly towards us, and it's our honor to give back to the Lord. Proverbs 3 and 9 says, To honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of your produce or your crops, or your income, or your increase, whatever word you want to insert there, honor the Lord with the best of what you have, because he's the giver of every good and perfect gift. How many of you believe that? Yeah. And the last value for us is integrity. Somebody say integrity. integrity. Integrity is what defines the character of a holy person. If you say, I belong to Jesus, and I'm holy, then that means, holiness doesn't mean that you're some kind of stuck-up a uh, uh, holier-than-thou, judgmental person who doesn't have compassion or the ability to connect to other people. Holiness simply means that you have character. More specifically, the character of Jesus. Amen? And so that's what integrity is. It is the definition of holy. All right? Integrity is what you do when nobody is watching you. You do the right thing just because it's the thing to do. And you don't do it because someone was looking. Are you with me, somebody? And integrity is what demands the very best from us in everything that we say and in everything that we do. When we speak, we speak honestly. We speak truthfully. And when we act, we act out of integrity and honesty. We show up on time. We pay our bills on time. And when we keep our promises, that's integrity. I wish God would help us with that because I think some of us have a wrong idea of what holiness is. Holiness is simply having good character. And for those of us who follow Jesus, it's the character of Jesus imprinted on your life. Is that good? We have a simple process and, uh, that we take people through. And again, like I said last week, we talked about encountering God. Let me just tell you quickly that this is really... Uh, a very big part for us. We believe our Sunday services are designed really to be a place where people can really encounter God and meet Jesus. I met Jesus in November 23rd, 1980 at a church in Jamaica, Queens. Powerful service. God's presence was there. God's power was there. I was doing drugs and all kind of stuff. I was a party animal. My life was messed up. I was confused, but the power of God was in that church And it is there that I had an encounter with God that I didn't know was possible in church. Because my opinion of church was, it's a place where you go to be quiet and some guy plays an organ. And you sit there and you listen and you look at your watch until it's time to leave. And then when they say amen, you bolt out the door. That for me was what church was. And I didn't like Christians at all. I thought Christians were dumb and I thought church was boring. And God met me powerfully in that church and there my life changed and so I took this idea that church should be a place where people can meet God in a powerful way that is transformative to them that's why we do church the way we do church I make no apologies for that to give you that opportunity how many of you met him in a church service more than half of you some of you weren't listening so you're like well, what did he what did he say everybody's raising their hand should I raise my Stay with me. Stay with me. Stay with me. We're on a journey. Amen? (laughs) In church services, it's an opportunity for you to go and invite people to the house of God that they can have that experience. Jesus gave us a command. He said, go and make disciples. Come on. Go and make disciples. And part of how we do that is we, we invite people to come and be a part of what we're doing. And if God meets them here, amen, God's, things are going to happen. Things are going to happen. And we believe in that. Share Jesus. Invite people. All right? Because God has called us to reach our city, our nation, and our world with this good news about Jesus. And you can help us do that in, in these ways. All right? Praying. How many of you know how to pray? Talk to God. You can help us by praying. Pray for everything that we've been talking about, that God would bless and make, a, make it successful, that the church will become 
more efficient and, 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 and that we, our team, can be a little bit more a sharper even and, and have a, a, something that drives us even more to reach the people of God. Pray for the church. Pray for them. Jesus said, you know, the harvest is ripe, but the labor is a few. And he says, pray and ask the Lord of the harvest that he will send workers into the harvest. In other words, he's talking about seeing people who are lost and without vision and without a shepherd. And he's saying, man, we need people to go and get these folks and make them understand that there's a better way to live their lives. And so when you pray, pray that God would raise up people that would join the team also. I mean, that's a practical prayer to pray. He says, pray for workers. How many of you are already a worker in the church? Six people. Oh, God, help us. We... Pray. Another way that you can serve is by giving. Give your time, your resources to reach people for the Lord. Jesus said, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But he says, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your, listen, where your treasure is, there your heart is. Well, being that some powerful words by Jesus, I won't preach it. It just means that if I give to the house of God and to the work of God, I, my heart for people and my heart for what God is doing, my passion for that will only grow. Amen? Amen. So we, we believe in, in giving. We believe in tithing in our church. Amen. Proverbs says that we should honor the Lord with our wealth and with the first fruit of our produce. Then he says, your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats burst forth with wine. In other words, God will bless you back for honoring him. He'll bless you back for honoring him with your stuff. Some people think that, you know, giving in church is, is, is not synonymous. You know, we've been taught wrong ideas about money and, and we think money is a very evil thing. And it's just twisting a, a simple and very powerful biblical truth. The Bible says the love of money is a root of all evil. Which of us can change anything without having money to do that? If you didn't have money to pay your bills, you would not have a roof over your head. I was on Facebook a couple of months back and a guy... I guess he was being a smart aleck. He, he posed the question and so many people started responding to it. He says, if, if money, uh, he says, if the money is the root of all evil, why does the church ask you for your money? And oh, you should have seen the comments just started, just all these stupid comments. And I typed in and I says, if money is evil, why do you work so hard for it? <laughs> Conversation over. You just need to shift how you think about money. We are using money to change the world. We raise, come on. <laughs> Not only locally here, but you know, we went to Lebanon, Middle East last year. You are in the, we are in the Middle East. Two years in a row on missions and helped the schools there that, to, that, to serve their community. We, we fed hungry people. We brought medicine and care packages of food for people there. Because of your giving. That's just one thing we're doing. We, we, we give to Samaritan's Purse. And you know they, they feed hungry people all around the world. Places where I can't go. Are you with me? Through your giving. There may be people that are willing to, to, to give and, and, and give bulk supply from missions and to charitable organizations. But they don't give it. You still have to pay for it. You can buy medicine in bulk. You can buy food in bulk. But you still have to pay for it. So money makes things move. And you've got to stop being so hyper-spiritual that you cross over into being dumb when it comes to money. The devil makes you believe money is evil. <laughs> but the Bible doesn't say that. Money, God says to love money is problematic. Then we, then we run into problems. So giving is important to us. Amen? Inviting people to church. That's important. You know? Serving people. How many of you know save people, serve people? We, we value that you serve here. And that's one way that you can help us carry out the mission that God has called us to do. When we started our church, like I said, it was my wife and I and our five children and a few friends. And I remember that first Christmas that, you know, you know that Christmas thing that we do every now with our, for our team. 
we, we have a big, we went a banquet hall, and we have an appreciation for all those of you who serve. How many of you were there this year? Come on. Don't be jealous. Next year, you can be there. Get on the team. You can be, join the G squad. You can be there with us. But you know how that started? When we started our church, right? We were just, my wife and I were just amazed that people actually trusted us. And they came to learn about God from us. And when Christmas came, we decided to have a little dinner ourselves. And we invited the people, a few people that we had in our congregation. And we, we, we put two long tables down in our living room. And uh, myself, her, and our, oldest, our older child at the time, uh, Tennille, and my, uh, her sister behind her. We got behind that table and we, we created a buffet. And people came through and we served them. And I was tearful. I was, I, my heart was so full thinking, what have I stepped into? But I felt so happy that people would actually come and listen to us tell them about God. And so we started that tradition. And of course, my wife, you know, she takes things to the next level. (laughs) It wasn't long before she said, we have to have a banquet, a real banquet for people. Amen? Amen? So every year now, we have this huge thing to appreciate All of you who serve. Because we value people who serve. We know we could not do what we do without those of you who serve. Come on, clap your hands. This is teamwork. Let me kind of jump down a little bit um, because of the time. I don't want to. Mm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Get me down to the next slide where it talks about empower. All right? What we want to do is we want to encourage you through what we're doing here on this journey that on week four, please come and invite people. Because the way you're empowered to serve here is that we're going to, we want to make sure that uh, you, you, you guys understand that it comes through serving. We're going to equip you. We're going to teach you. But the empowerment is so that you can go out and make a difference. And so we're going to encourage you guys to join our G squad. What's the G squad? I'm glad you asked. That's our team. These are the guys who help make things happen. And you volunteer here. You're part of the G squad. Amen. We're going to get you squad up so you can get out there. And, 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 and help us be a part. And I tell you what, it is so fulfilling to serve and to know that you're part of making the difference that's being made. I don't want anyone to come into our church and feel like it's just, I can be here 10 years, 5 years, and all I do is I come and I get myself and I leave. Now, don't get me wrong. Some of you have busy lives and you, you just barely have enough time to come in on Sunday. Some of you have to leave here and go to work. That, that's Maybe that you're in the minutia, those of you who have to do that. But I understand those of you whose lives are so structured, right? But for those of us who can come in and, 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 and serve and, and give our time here, let me tell you something. I want you to, 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 to not miss the opportunity on, on, on the fifth Sunday to, to jump in. Because I want you to become empowered to make a difference. Amen. I don't want you to miss out on the joy of knowing that you help make something happen. I don't want you just to be satisfied with watching things happen. I want you to say, hey, I'm a part of making something happen. Oh, and that's a good thing. It's good. It's good. Every one of us were created by God to make a difference in the life of another person. And God has a place for you where your unique gifts and abilities and passions can impact the lives of other people. And we believe that your life will never make sense until you find, develop, and fulfill your God-given purpose. And we're working hard to help you get there. Hallelujah. Are you with me so far? Good so far? Who people thinks this is good? I'm encouraged. You all are something else. Can I tell you all a little joke? There was a guy that was uh, on the witness stand. He was being cross-examined in court. And the lawyer comes up to him and says, Sir, 
you know, he's suing for damages from an automobile accident that he had. The lawyer comes up to him and says, sir, did you not go on record as saying on the day of your accident when you were asked by the sheriff, I never felt better? Did you say that? And the guy said, yes, I did. He said, well, how is it then that you're suing for damages from an accident after which you said, I never felt better? Well, he said, sir, while I was laying there after the accident, the sheriff arrived on the scene. There was a horse that had broken its leg and the sheriff went right over to the horse. He put a gun to the horse's head and shot the horse. (laughs) Then there was a dog that had broken its back. He went right up to the dog, put a gun to the dog's head and shot the dog. And then he came over to me. And he said, how are you doing? So I said, I never felt better. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) Is that good? Here's something that Paul said about purpose. First of all, Ephesians 2.10 said that God, we are God's workmanship that were created in Jesus Christ. You know, for good works. God created you to do good things. And everybody, we kind of know this. That's why people are philanthropic. That's why people always want to help. They do something. It's something in us that just wants to help somebody. Because God put that desire in us to want to help other people. Amen. Paul said it this way when it comes to his life purpose. He said, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord has given me. Isn't that good? So at Generations Church, you know, we believe that every member is a minister. Every task is important and everyone who serves is a 10 in a specific area. In other words, there's something that you are really good at. Some of you already know that because maybe you, 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 you serve in a profession where your giftings and your natural inclinations are perfectly matched. Some of you don't think about those things, right? Some of you just do things because that's where the money is, but you, you're not perfectly matched with what you do. It, it puts the bread on the table. But God has given you gifts and a natural inclination or a certain type of pro- proclivity towards a, a certain things that when you do them, you feel so fulfilled. And we're going to give you a spiritual uh, gift inventory and uh, you're going to see how God's going to reveal your gifts. That we're going to try to match you with something that you can find joy in doing in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen? Amen. All right, I'll tell you how to do that in a minute. So join the G Squad. That's important. We want you to get involved. All right? And uh, that will happen at a point when we're, we're finished with this four weeks. Then we're going to give you an opportunity to just sit in one class next month where the spiritual gift inventory will, you'll go through that and then we'll take you to the next place where you can say, all right, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. And that's where we want to get you. Get me down to uh, our doctrine. This is important. I want to finish with this. I want to just cover a few things quickly about what we believe as a church as I'm watching the time. I'm not going to go through all of these things. Some of you may be seasoned, mature Christians from other churches and you already have uh, a certain, I guess, um, uh, proclivity towards a kind of a particular branding or, you know, I, I'm, I'm a Baptist and so I, you know, I like this kind of belief system or I, I'm, I'm Catholic or I want to know if you believe in these things. Whatever your background is, let me just give you some basic things. And what I would tell you is this. I'm just going to touch on a few of our core beliefs, doctrinally what we believe. But I also want to recommend that you go to our website and there's a whole... Uh, entree there of what we believe as a church. I think you owe it to yourself if you care, because you might be saying, this is my second or third week here. Like, what kind of church is this? Or, you know, what, what do these people believe? And that, if that's important to you, there's nothing wrong with that. I, I quite frankly, myself, if I'm visiting a church, I'm pretty good because I've been around the, the block a few times. I, I can pick things up. You know, I'm, my analytical skills when it comes to the things of God and the things of the church are pretty sharp. But it's good to know what people believe. Because there's some weird things going around right now in the name of church and Christianity. So we have that on our website for you. Go ahead, peruse that. Let me walk you through a quick thing. First, the Bible. Somebody say the Bible. 
We believe the Bible and only the Bible is the authoritative word of God. We believe that. It alone has the final authority to determine all doctrinal truths. In its original writing, it is inspired, it is infallible, and it is inerrant. Okay? That's what we believe because that's what the Bible says about itself. And I, can, I don't have time to get into the details of how accurate all the manuscripts of the Bible that they have found and how many manuscripts of the Bible exist and everyone accurate. And so I don't have time. In fact, no book has been more translated and has more, no ancient book has been more translated and has more manuscripts than the Holy Bible without error. And that in itself speaks volumes. Amen? So you'll hear a lot of people saying, oh, this, and well, man wrote the Bible. Of course, man wrote the Bible. The Bible says it's inspired by God. Man wrote it, but it is inspired. God didn't come down and write it himself. He inspired men to record the things that they experienced with him. That's what the Bible is. And it reveals something to us about who God is and what he is like. All right, but I won't spend the time on that. We, we are Trinitarian. We believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy... If you're Catholic, you really like that one. Catholics love that one. You know, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That's, we are Trinitarian. We believe in the Trinity because the Bible is clear that God has revealed himself. There is one God, but the Bible reveals three persons, which is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, about which the Bible is clear that they share in their eternality, and in their deity. And so we accept that. There's a, it's a mystery, but it is something that we accept. Because God is a mystery. He is too deep for us to fully comprehend. Hallelujah. God is a mystery, and he is too deep for us to fully comprehend. But what God has revealed of himself to us, we are thankful for it. I'm safe with that. Amen? She won. She just kept looking at me and looking at her, and I felt her eyes just driving me back. So it finally drove me to come up here. Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The second power in the triune Godhead, Jesus came to earth in human form through the virgin birth. Although he lived within the confines of his humanity, he was 100% man and 100% God. And during his earthly life, Jesus taught about the kingdom of God. He performed miracles and he died on the cross to atone for the sins of the world. We believe that Jesus Christ is who he says he is. I have no questions, no doubts, no issues. Amen? Uh, salvation. Let's get down to salvation. 4.6. We believe that we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus. His death, burial, and resurrection, we believe in that. Salvation is a gift from God. It is not the result of any work that you do. Please hear me. I said this last week. I'm saying it again. There are too many people who think they have to be good for God to love them. There are too many people who think that they're not worthy, worthy of God. The reason why a lot of people don't come to church is this, is this very thing. Well, I'm, I'm just, you know, I, 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 I got so many issues. And God says, that's, who I, that's what I love about you. Yes. I, I came for people like you. And, and, and you, you don't work to save yourselves. All the good things that I'm telling you that we do as a church is service that gives honor and glory to God. It is the result of having been saved. Remember I said, saved people serve people. We're not serving to be saved. We're not serving to be loved. We're already loved by God. It is not by works. Get this in your mind. Salvation is a free gift. Jesus paid the price. I accept that. And if you believe that, you too can be saved. It's just that simple. The sacraments. The sacraments. Three sacraments that God has given us, which is marriage, communion, and baptism. We believe in and practice those things. I won't get into the details about that, um, but we believe in the sacraments. Amen? And we celebrate communion. Today, we are going to be doing another one of those sacraments. Today, we are baptizing some people after church, right upstairs in our chapel. If you want to witness that, you can join us. Well, let me tell you this. 
I believe that there are three baptisms. That's what the Bible teaches. Three baptisms. Three. Three. When you were initially uh, born again, we are baptized into Christ, and we receive the spirit of adoption that identifies us as sons of God. Then we are baptized in water. So that first baptism is a baptism of regeneration. The second is water baptism. That's where we bury the old man. Amen? And we identify with Jesus' his death and resurrection. And then there's spirit baptism. How many have been baptized in the Holy Spirit? Full of the Holy Ghost. Amen? And there, we believe in that. And the spirit baptism empowers you to live the new life that God has given you. All right? And the last thing is we believe in the return of Jesus Christ. Nobody knows when Jesus is coming back. You don't hear me talk about that much. It's not because we don't believe it. But that so many people are preoccupied with when Jesus is coming. No one knows when he's coming back. What I know is that Jesus has given us a mandate to occupy until he returns. We've got work to do. We've got people to reach. And so we're not worried about what we can't control. We want to do the work that he has left us to do. So we believe that Christ is going to return. I'm going to wrap the session here by saying to you, hey, commit to membership. That's the whole goal of what we're doing here this month. Okay? Commit, if you have not yet, commit to membership. As I said before, if, if you don't believe after you've stayed with me these few weeks that this is the house where God wants you to be, find one. There's got to be a church somewhere that, that makes you, when you go there, feels like, oh, this is what I've been looking for. And if this is not it, it's fine. And I will thank you for the time you invested to be with us these few weeks. I would thank you from the bottom of my heart. And I would even pray. I would even recommend somewhere for you. I just know that you need to be in a church family somewhere. Is that good? I'd like it to be our church, but it doesn't have to be. Amen? Okay. Here's why I believe it's important to be in church. A Christian without a church is like a soldier without a platoon, an athlete without a team. Um, I'm an athlete. Well, what team do you play for? Oh, I'm just an athlete. Just this athletic person. Well, where are you going to express that? Where are you going to live that out? You need to be a part of something. I can give you a whole lot many more reasons. But membership is a statement of commitment. And listen to it. David Brooks, the author, one of my favorite authors, David Brooks said this. He says, commitment is open rebellion against the I'm free to be me individualistic culture that defines our age. It is a refusal to aim for personal happiness and the choice to aim for moral joy. What's the difference between joy and happiness? Happiness is when something good happens for you. Joy is when you give something away. Joy is when you make somebody smile. Because you reached deep inside of yourself and did something nice and sacrificial for somebody else. The world is not going to teach you these things because this whole country's ethic is built on this, the pursuit of happiness. And, and we've, we've pursued happiness until we've run that into the ground. Listen, the most satisfied and fulfilled people are committed people. People who are deeply committed to something. Committed to a marriage. Come on. Committed to a, an ethic, a, a, a faith, or a philosophy of life. Committed so that what you do, there's a why for what you do. There's a purpose behind your actions. You're not just following a crowd or, or aiming at the, the, the wind. You're doing things because something drives you. You know the why. It's why you get up in the morning. And it keeps your passion fueled. Because you have an ethic, or a philosophy, or in my case, a faith that guides my life. Everyone needs that. And so that comes from being what? Committed. People don't want to get married, but how many of you know that you need to be committed? So I help some of you ladies here, because some of the men need a push. You need to be what? Pick a woman. Decide. Valentine's Day is coming up. Go get her a nice rock. Take it to one of our local restaurants here in the city. We have many of them. Get on your knees and tell her, baby. You can finish that. Then come tell me about it and I'll get you all fixed up. Amen. I've got three weddings this spring. I'm excited. Three men here decided to get what? Committed. Ladies, there's hope. There's hope. There's hope. There's hope. There's hope. 
A couple of men decided to take the leap. And I'm excited. I'm a big cheerleader for that. Get committed. There's joy in commitment. Commitment is transformational. It will change who you are. All right, so I'm going to wrap it here. But remember, when you, when you, to become a member here, you just got to complete your, your next step. So this journey that we're giving you is a preview of that. And if you finish this journey with us and you're not a member, you can opt in at the end. And that'll be exciting. Amen? And you, you also, we need you. We're going to give you a membership covenant. You'll review that. You'll sign that. And, and that's part of that as well. And then we're going to ask you, if you're going to join, join the G Squad. Get into some area of service in this church because we don't want you just sitting around on your duff gathering dust. You've got gifts and people need to experience you. People need to experience you. You know, you're, you, the world is waiting for you to happen to it. Come on, somebody. The world is saying, where you been? Come on, you gifted, beautiful person. Come on. Something is waiting for your touch to change. Are you there? All right. Clap your hands. Give God praise right there. I am finished. Bow your heads. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our time together. And thank you, Lord, for people. Thank you for uh, just uh, the ability, Lord, to unpack a vision. Thank you for those whose hearts have caught this vision. And we just pray that, Lord God, you would cause every one of us to see ourselves in the purpose and in the plan of God, even as it unfolds. I pray, Father, if there's someone here under the sound of my voice that does not know Jesus as Lord, I even ask you now, Lord, that you would touch their hearts. Let them say yes to you in Jesus' name. While your heads are still bowed, I want to tell you real quick, and I've already told you, God loves you so much. And God wants you to be closer to him. And he sent his son, Jesus, to bring you closer to him. And all you have to do today, trust me, trust me. All you have to do is believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is the son of God. And the Bible says, you shall be saved. Today you can take a step towards God and start your journey of becoming closer to God. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed again, just listen to my voice. Say the simple prayer with me. Say, Jesus, I believe with all my heart that you are the Son of God and my only Savior. Thank you for dying, for taking my place, that I might be saved right now. I put my trust in you. I confess you as my Lord and as my Savior. And I thank you, Lord, for forgiving my sins and giving me a fresh start today. In Jesus' name, amen.